Right, I don't anticipate it'll take the whole day today for the pages recovering. P covering 382 through the bottom of 384. And introduction to the gas phase. Like in the introduction, it talks about how we've, we've discussed solids, obviously, from the very beginning, and then liquids, and now we're moving into gas, and that there's one additional parameter of the gases that we measure. Liquids, we measure the mass, we measure the volume. Um, for gases, we do the same thing, the mass, the volume, but we're also going to be looking at pressure because pressure is going to change, um, I could say, the appearance of the atoms or the molecules, but basically what it looks like to us, and it'll make more sense as we go through. So the definition of pressure, basically, you see that on equation 11.1 1 on the top of 383 is that pressure is the force per area. Pressure. Force per area. And I think they mentioned in there too that if you've been in algebra, you recognize that area is a square unit. It's like meters squared covering the surface area that we're talking about. We kind of alluded to this earlier talking about uh, atmospheric pressure. And I said in here that we all have the atmosphere that we're in. Remember on like one of the first couple days of class, maybe the first day of class or the intro to class, we talked about this idea that we are, do fish know that they're in water? And do you remember that you're actually in air? That you're not walking around here in a vacuum. That you're completely surrounded by molecules and atoms all the time, primarily molecules in the atmosphere. Okay? Because most of the elements that are in the atmosphere are homonuclear diatomics. And so we have molecules that are around us a lot of the time, or all the time, that are around us. And that we actually experience the pressure of them on us all the time. You feel, maybe you sense right now that you don't have any weight on your shoulders unless you're carrying burdens from other things other than the atmosphere, right? But this weight that's pressing down on you, you're used to this. this the gases that are around you pressing in on you, we're used to that because we operate as living organisms in, an, in a system which has a relatively constant pressure. This is the pressure that we were born into, we live in our whole lives. So we don't recognize it as being something unique. If you can speculate about going to another planet, let's say another planet that had the same exact gravity we have but had a different makeup in the atmosphere, that you might feel a different pressure from the gases on that planet. And that sometimes, you know, whether it be gravity or atmospheric pressure, sci-fi movies and things play on that, that advantage of that of why do you need particular kinds of suits or particular kinds of uh, man-made exoskeletons in order to exist at a particular planet. It's because of the differences in the gravity or the differences in the atmospheric pressure that's pushing onto us. I said too, also, you could think of it, though it's not perfect, perfectly true, but think of it as the air that's above you, the weight of that air resting on your shoulders. So for some of us that have bigger shoulders, we're carrying a lot more atmosphere around on top of us. And some people that might be a little more narrower in the shoulder. But you have that same pressure, but it's the same, it's a, the total n amount of force you have on you might be greater, but guess what? Because of the bigger shoulders, you're covering a greater surface area. And so the pressure is gonna feel basically the same. So pressure is a force per area. One way to visualize that, and I think, and again, I'm gonna stop saying I may have said it in here before because I, I have very few stories and I use them a lot. But think about it this way. If you had somebody standing on your chest in sneakers. They're wearing sneakers standing on your chest. Let's make it simple. One of the young ladies, you're standing on somebody on one of the guy's chests right there and they feel the wa your weight, okay? We know you're all 105, okay, so don't worry about it. But anyway, you're standing there on them, pr pressing, pressing down on that person. You're feeling a particular amount of weight, that force pushing down on you, okay? And then we say, okay, take the sneakers off and put on the heels. See, now the grimace is, you know that's not going to go well, right? If you change from the sneakers to the heels, and the smaller the heel, what would you expect? The more the pain. Why? Because you're going to have the same amount of force, the weight of the young lady, on that smaller area. So you've got the same force, smaller area is going to increase the pressure. And so that's what you feel is that same amount of force, the weight of the individual pushing down, but then being spread out over whatever surface area is making the contact, whether it be a heel 
Or if, you know, wrestling competition or something like that, you get two super heavies out there, but guess what? They're rolling around on the mat. They've got a large mass, a large force, their weight, but they're spread out over a large area. So it's not have, those, have the same crushing effect. So it's the force over the area is the pressure. When you, go, when you blow up a balloon, hopefully you realize what you're doing is introducing a gas and you've got a different pressure on the inside than on the outside, right? Is there a greater pressure on the inside or the outside of a balloon when you blow it up? I blow up a balloon, it's <laughs> fills up in my hand. Where's the greater pressure, inside or outside? Has to be inside, right? If there weren't greater pressure on the inside, the balloon would not expand. The pressure on the outside were greater, it would continue to hold it short. I would not be able to blow it up if I didn't create more pressure on the inside than on the outside, which then you've got the force of the atmosphere and you've got the force of the latex or whatever the balloon is made out of squeezing in as well. And there's a balance, there's an equilibrium that's reached very quickly. Okay, so real basic idea here that pressure is the force, the total force, divided by the area over which that force is being exerted. An example of standing on someone's chest on sneakers versus heels, and the tighter the heel, the more the pressure, the more the pain. Um, different force units, in here they mention that the unit of force is the Newton, and the Newton, obviously named for that teenage boy who invented physics and calculus, <laughs> Sir Isaac Newton, okay. Um, so you've got newtons per meter squared. So it's newtons of force divided by meters squared. Now we don't use just that unit as they say later on. There are several different units. We'll talk about that, those different units real briefly here in just a moment. Also to think about this in terms of the kinetic theory of matter as they talk about Blaise Pascal and they mention that Blaise Pascal who didn't even, they didn't even have the kinetic theory of matter at that time went through and figured out um, using Boyle's law, and Boyle, excuse me, Boyle who didn't have uh, kinetic theory of matter. The Bo it was Boyle that went through and figured out the relationship between pressure and volume, okay? But he did that without the kinetic theory of matter, but we have it, and they review that on page 383. Talking about, remember, just, we're gonna go back to this often. When I blow up that balloon, <laughs> and that balloon expands, we're saying yes, there's a greater pressure inside that balloon than there is outside, in order for the balloon to expand, it has to be that way. Now, why is the balloon expanding? There's gas in there, right? I'm full of hot air, you're full of hot air. <sighs> we blow this thing up. Okay. What is it that's actually exerting force? The, the material inside is not solid, is it? It's not solid, it's not liquid, it's a gas. And by nature, the gas are molecules or atoms which are not stuck together vibrating and they're not moving in real close proximity, they are pushing away. They're rapidly moving in there and pushing outside all the time. So if you think of it as, I'm just gonna draw a, a circle, but this represents a balloon, okay? If you've got a balloon in there, the reason why it's holding the shape it is, is we've, we've reached an equilibrium point where the forces that are pushing in and the forces that are pushing out have become equal. And so in any place you look, there are equal and opposite forces, some pushing in, some pushing out. What is creating the force that is pushing out? What's the motion of the molecules inside that balloon? Those molecules, which are bouncing all over the place, as they're striking, they're exerting an instantaneous force against the side of that balloon. Yes, they're rebounding, but guess what? As soon as they rebound, another one is taking their place because the nature of gases is constantly moving having collisions and change of momentum. We'll talk about this in a little more detail when we get to ideal gases. So we've got gases on the inside which are in motion pushing out, and that pushing out is, as they hit one side, it's a, it looks like a punch. But as they withdraw that punch, as they start heading the other direction, another one comes and takes its place. And so these molecules are continually hitting against the surface, pushing back. And at the same time, there are gases on the outside with a certain amount of pressure. They have a force, and they're exerting it, pushing in on the balloon. And so inside is motion. If this were to suddenly change from a gas to a liquid, okay, it's condensing out. 
what would you expect to happen to the balloon? If it's changing phase from a gas to a liquid, the gas that's inside, would it take up more or less volume? Less volume, right? So you might end up with a balloon with liquid in it, but it would be a much smaller balloon than it was with when it had a gas in it. The gas is pushing out. The liquid just kind of hanging out. The solid just like, leave me alone, I'm here vibrating, right? So as this would change from a gas to a liquid, it would take up less volume. Its nature is not such that it's pushing against the walls, punching up against the other gases on the outside, which are punching in. They introduce you to three different units of pressure on table 11.1. They said you don't necessarily have to memorize all of these, but in this case, I would want you to memorize these four numbers. That these four numbers are four different ways of saying the exact same thing. That one atmosphere another way to say that is 101 0.3 kilopascals, which is the same as seven hundred sixty millimeters of mercury, which is the same as seven hundred and sixty tor. Just as we said before that a certain mass of an element is the same as a certain number of moles of that element. You can figure that out, of, that out if you know the molar mass. And I've said that oftentimes. 300, like 350 grams of this, another way to say that is this many moles of that. If you can compute how many moles, it's same amount, just different ways of saying it. Here, an atmosphere, 101.3 kilopascals, 760 millimeters of mercury, and 760 tor are four ways of describing the same amount of pressure. And the, as I said, we live as biological entities. We live here under a pretty constant pressure. It's not always you listen to the meteorologists, AKA weather person, right, on the TV, and they tell you, hey, we've got a low pressure system, a high pressure system. They're describing in relatively high and low, but it's all about one atmosphere. A little bit above, a little bit below. See, we've got a barometer over here and it says right now that we are experiencing oh, 758 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so it's pretty close to one atmosphere. It would be considered low because it's lower than one atmosphere, but it's in the ballpark, right? We're not talking about radical pressure shifts. That'd be the kind of thing where you wake up one morning and go, I just can't get out of bed. Why? It's a high pressure system. I, I would expect only the strongest of you to make it in today. Why? Because the pressure is so high today. No, not, not like that. It's plus or minus a little bit. Sometimes it does affect people. You can feel the difference. But mostly we can see the difference outside because high and low pressures bring some predictable weather patterns to us. And this isn't meteorology, so we won't go into that. But there are some predictable weather patterns that we'll see based upon how high or low the pressure is outside. Yes, Will? Must affect my hearing. I can't hear you. When you're changing the height and uh, rapidly and it's off. Right, the same kind of thing. That's also why when you fly on an airplane, you have to pressurize the cabin. Because as you go up, there's less pressure on the outside. That's why in the movies and things, uh, if there's you know, a shot inside the, inside the fuselage, you know, it goes from everything from this rapid sucking of the air and papers start flying to structural collapse of the aircraft. I mean, once you get a breach, you can, the plane can come apart in flight. And it's because the structure of the, has been compromised, okay? And there's such a pressure differential between the inside and the outside of the airplane that when they fly, they pressurize it so that we can, well, first of all, have a pressure we're more comfortable at and familiar with, Second, um, maintain the oxygen inside because the low pressure outside will suck all the necessary oxygen and things out with it. So, a couple different reasons for that. Yes, ma'am. Um, what is millimeters per mercury? Millimeters per mercury. Back old-fashioned barometers, like way back a couple, maybe 
10 years ago. Um, <laughs> but up until very recently, you know, the primary way of measuring is, and actually I believe this is, still uses mercury, is, and I haven't, I haven't explained this in a long time, so I might be slightly off, but here's the concept. You have a tube that's open on one end, and it, you put mercury in it. Quicksilver, right? So you put mercury in it, and, it, and it, mercury is at a certain point. It reaches a level point like that. And they determine, okay, what is one atmosphere? Where is the level of one atmosphere? For people that had the authority to say so, they said, guess what? That's gonna, we're going to call that 760 millimeters of mercury. Now, there was probably more logic behind it than that. Like, for whatever tube they put in there, you know, that they had, they, there probably was an objective place where it was at. But, so what happens? As this end of the tube is open, as the, pr and so we've got the atmospheric pressure pushing down all the time in that opening, okay? As this atmospheric pressure increases, okay, this level goes up. So this pressure is going to push this mercury like this. And so because it's pushing down harder, it's a higher pressure, which makes the level in here go higher. And so millimeters of mercury is just how high the mercury level was on a tube like this. And so you can see this going up and down based upon greater or lesser pressure on the open end from the atmosphere. And over here, this is a spring type we've got mounted on the wall. But it uses the same principle. It's, it's rather than an open tube, it's a compression or relaxing. So as there's a bladder in there that gets pressed more as the pressure gets higher, causes the dial to turn towards a higher pressure number. Okay. But we'll learn which of these we can actually use in calculations. So you may at times get one or the other um, right now, I believe, and I haven't reviewed the questions, to be honest, since last year's test, so I haven't gone through to, s to look at the actual questions, but we're going to go through and learn which of these we can use in particular formulas. In some cases, it's the same. Remember, I said before, as long as you use the same units, like if I'm talking, uh, if I'm using just straight uh, multiplication, it's just keep the units the same. As long as you use the same units, you can end up with the same units. But it'll make, it'll make more sense as we go through each Boyle's, Charles, combined, ideal, all the different formulas that we have. All right. So again, nothing magical there. Just be familiar that those four are all the same thing. They're four different ways of saying the same thing. And just remember, too, that scientists have not, the nature of science is they don't do this stuff all together. Hey, everybody in the world that's working on pressure we're going to meet at Phil's house on Thursday and solve this thing, and we're going to come up with an answer where we're all going to use the same thing. No. You have people all over the world working on stuff. And if an idea comes to someone and they start using it before they ever publish it, before it ever becomes standardized, you know, some guy with a J-tube there using mercury in his basement figured out pressure, that the level will actually change based on the atmospheric pressure. And so he's using it and he's doing it before the rest of the world even knows what he's thinking. And someday it comes out and somebody from another country goes, oh yeah, I was doing the kind of same thing, but I called it, you know, Tor. Okay. And I, I didn't start at 760, but you know what? For every one that your moves, mine moves one too. So we're kind of locked in. So, hey, guess what? 750 millimeters is also the same as 750 Tor. Oh, we just had a different name, what we called it. This sounds like something from more of a, like a, a Nordic country, right? What do you've got? Tor from his son Thor. Okay, so, but kilopascals, Blaise Pascal was the one this was named after. And they mentioned Blaise in there. Um, um, and then we kind of standardized it to say one atmosphere. It's what we're used to living under, is one atmosphere's worth of pressure. All right, so barometers, and also they mentioned in here the manometer. There's a figure 11-1, a picture of that dial. A manometer is a pressure gauge that goes on a canister, a container, when you're checking if you have enough propane, for example. Actually, that's a liquid, never mind. But we use it as a gas, but in the, in the tank it's actually a liquid. 
But if you have a gas in a container, you want to know what the pressure is inside the container, a manometer is the gauge you look at to find out how many, it could be pounds of pressure as opposed to pounds of liquid. But whatever the pressure is inside, the manometer is the one that reads that for you. So, All right, let's get into a law. Now, what is the difference between a theory and a law? Do you remember? Did we talk about that in here? That actually might have been general science from co-op, Will. I'm thinking, <laughs> okay. The difference between a theory and a law, basically a law is a proven theory, or a, a theory that has yet to be disproven after intensive trial and error. A law is something that's treated as universally true, though ultimately we can never finally prove anything. That's one of the things about science as a religion versus science as a methodology. For example, you will, I was, happened to have a show on television the other day and they were talking about um, the difference between a theory and a law. And whether or not something was true, absolutely, or whether it was considered true. And it was dealing with evolution. And in the show, it was a sitcom, but the statement was made, you know, the theory of evolution, no, Mom, it's fact. It's fact. That'll get into your whole philosophy of science if you determine that it's a fact and not a theory. A theory means it's one way of explaining, but a law goes through with being able to replicate it, the scientific method. Can I take it? Can I replicate it? Why is evolution not a fact or a law? You can't replicate it. You can't set it up and do it again. Okay? So... There are limits to what we can come out and say, this is absolutely factual of what happened versus this is a theory of what happened. You know, if we want to talk about the theories, I think there's some insightful things, even though we may disagree with the theory, about hearing the tenets of the theory. And um, But that's where you get into science as a philosophy and a basis of truth. And as Christians, you have to recognize that we've got, we have a little tension there, don't we? Where's our basis of truth? And where are we, where are we saying the ultimate truth is at? If you reject one authority source as being absolute truth, by nature we look to something else, and eventually, if we don't claim anything else, we claim ourselves. Because I know. Okay, let's talk about knowing. How can you know? Or how can you know that you know? And do you really know what you think you know? It sounds like we're just doing circular logic, but we're really not. To what, to what grandeur do you present yourself as being the one who contains absolute truth? to which everyone else must yield. So we look for something outside of ourselves. A law, then, is something that stated, was originally a hypothesis, was a theory, and through time has been accepted as a law. And it's generally accepted without question, except by those people who continue to press to try to prove it's not a law. But for the most part, we accept it. And Boyle's law is just that thing. Boyle, obviously the Robert Boyle was the individual, an Irish uh, physicist and chemist who figured out this law, and all he basically said was that in a gas sample, its pressure times its volume is constant. You can see on figure 11-2, and it shows this cylinder that has a plunger top. Think of it as a car cylinder, if that resonates with you. But if not, you've got a sample, a closed system of gas, and on the first one, it says there's a certain mass that's sitting on top of that plunger. And so a certain mass pushes down on that plunger and it compresses inside the cylinder. It comes to the place where in that cylinder, the gases that are pushing back and the weight that's pushing down, they're going to reach an equilibrium. The force exerted by the pressure exerted by the gas inside as those molecules are bouncing around, pushing, punching up against that diaphragm is equal to the force of whatever weight or whatever force is pushing down. And that's where the plunger is going to stop. And what he says is if I take that plunger and I make a greater weight on it, I will bring it down to a new level. And when I bring it down to the new level, the volume is going to be smaller, but the pressure is going to be greater. 
So as I put more weight on it, they put more force on it, I'm going to put force on it that the force, the pressure inside, think of it this way, the force inside has got to equal the force on the outside. The force on the inside, as I make the volume smaller, gets greater. As I squeeze it, it feels more pressure. But it feels more pressure as that it's at a smaller volume, it takes up less space. You can see that moving from left to right on the figure. A plunger with a lighter weight on it, the molecules are far apart. As I increase the weight, as I push harder down on the plunger, this volume becomes smaller, and as the volume becomes smaller, the pressure becomes larger. And there's this inverse relationship going on. As this goes up, this must go down and stay constant, with the caveat that the temperature doesn't change. That's important. The constant temperature. So under constant temperature, increasing pressure produces a decreasing volume, and vice versa. Another way of writing this, we see it over on 386, is that if we think of the plunger as one plunger or one cylinder with three different plunger positions that was shown in the last figure. If I have, if I have a pressure and a volume in the first state, if I change the plunger position, which means I'm going to change the volume, whatever I change it to, it's going to change the volume. And the pressure times the volume in the first state is equal to the pressure times the volume in the second state. And if you look at that same figure, it's equal to the pressure times the volume in the third state. The product of pressure times volume is going to be constant if I don't change the temperature. Because if I change the temperature, what do I do? Something to think about it. If I have a gas and I change the temperature, I'm adding energy to the system, right? If I add energy to the system, I'm increasing the velocity of the molecules, okay? I'm, it's no longer a closed system. I'm bringing energy into the system. So as long as the temperature doesn't change, the pressure times the volume of any closed system is going to be equal to the pressure times the volume at a different pressure or volume. So if I'm giving pressure and, pressure and volume in one condition, and I'm told the temperature doesn't change, I can then compute either the pressure or the volume in the second, given one of them. If I'm given the second pressure, I can compute the second volume. Or given the second volume, I can compute the second pressure. <laughs>